Welcome to the 15th annual David L. Janetta Distinguished Lecture Series in War, Literature, and the Arts. I'd like to begin our evening by thanking our sponsor, Mr. David Janetta, a 1975 graduate of the Academy, and as well as the USAFA Endowment for making this endowed lecture possible. It's now my distinct pleasure to welcome to the stage our benefactor, a tremendous supporter of the humanities, Mr. Janetta, who will introduce our poets and musicians. Please give Mr. Janetta a warm welcome. Good evening, General Attenda, uh, honored and distinguished guest, uh, and most of all cadets. How about those Falcons? Yeah. Yeah, yeah a great, uh, a great uh, weekend last week, and uh, let's not focus too much on the betting line this week, but uh, certainly things look pretty, pretty healthy. So uh, it's a great, great way to start the year. Everybody have a good summer. Anyone do airborne this summer? A couple. Now you're three degrees for the most part, right? So that's more next year. Well, I, I was thinking about airborne because back in the day, uh, Nordy Schwartz, Nordy uh, was a class of 73 and he, uh, very distinguished career in the Air Force, uh, was the chief of staff uh, to end his career and uh, very distinguished. He retired about 10 years ago. But back in the day, um, he was a firstie, we were three degrees, and he would give us advice and wisdom on what to do in the summer, what summer electives to, uh, to sign up for. And I'll never forget the one piece of wisdom that sticks with me today was he, he sat in the, in the room and said, well, I'll tell you one thing. If at first you don't succeed, don't sign up for parachuting. And um, oh, come on, that's not that bad. Come on, come on, come on. Well, well, we all sat around and said, with wisdom like that, there's no way this guy is not going to be a general officer someday. Um, but there are many ways to enhance your wisdom. And our program this year is something a little different, something that I hope will expand your vision and your toolkit of experiences and perhaps your wisdom to help you make better informed decisions in your career. I often quote Sidney Harmon, who was the founder of Harmon Industry, a billion dollar company that specializes in high-end sound systems. I'm sure you've heard of them. Uh, Harmon used to say that he wanted his managers to be poets. He wanted his managers to be poets. He said, poets are our original systems thinkers. They look at our most complex environments and they reduce the complexity to something that they begin to understand. Well, tonight we have two highly acclaimed poets, Dunya McHale and Brian Turner, along with the McLaren String Quartet from the Colorado Springs Philharmonic. You've seen their biographies up on the screen earlier, so I won't uh, go over them. We do have a very packed uh, uh, program for this evening, but my wish is for all of you to listen, to enjoy the presentations, to absorb some of the wisdom and take another step towards understanding the complexity of your lives as you prepare to become future leaders in the Air Force. With that, uh, welcome Mikhail, Nunya Mikhail and Brian Turner. On with the show. <laughs>
There will be rain in the story, a series of voices, birds, maybe a character flaw some find charming. There will be pain, of course, and laughter, some small sweet gesture, like the way she used to hold my face in the soft cups of her palms before kissing me. Moments that gather into something one might call a life. This story we tell ourselves as loved ones cross over one by one. We are learning how to care for the dead, each in our own way. So too the living. We lean our heads back and listen to music translated from the air as memory draws our fingers through a loved one's hair before brushing the stone to reveal the pulling shadows of the chisel. It's something like prayer, I think. The way others might talk to God within the vaulted spaces of the body, one's voice spoken into the long corridors swept clean of shadow there by the opened windows where the birds might one day fly in at dawn, singing. Good evening. I will read this poem, uh, part of it in Arabic, just to give you the flavor of the language, and then I read it complete, uh, the full poem in English. Al Harb Tam al Bijid. Kam hi mujidatun al Harbu, wa nashita, wa bari'a. Mundu sabah al Bakr, tuqidu sufarat al Indar. Tabathu sayarati isafin ila muhtalaf al Amkina. تؤرجح جثثا في الهواء تزحلق نقالات إلى الجرحى تستدعي مطرا من عيون الأمهات تحفر في التراب تخرج أشياء كثيرة من تحت الأنقاض أشياء جامدة براقة وأخرى باهتة ما زالت تنبض تأتي بالمزيد من الأسئلة إلى أذهان الأطفال تسلي الآلهة بإطلاق صواريخ وألعاب نارية في السماء تزرع الألغام في الحقول تحصد ثقوبا وفقاعات The war works hard How magnificent the war is How eager and efficient Early in the morning it wakes up the sirens and dispatches ambulances to various places, swings corpses through the air, rolls the treasures to the wounded, summons rain from the eyes of mothers, digs into the earth, dislodging many things from under the ruins. Some are lifeless and glistening. Others are pale and still throbbing. It produces the most questions in the minds of children, entertains the gods by shooting fireworks and missiles into the sky, sows mines in the fields and reaps punctures and blisters, urges families to immigrate, stands beside the clergymen as they curse the devil. Poor devil, he remains with one hand in the searing fire. The war continues working day and night. It inspires tyrants to deliver long speeches, awards medals to generals and themes to poets. It contributes to the industry of artificial limbs, provides food for flies, adds pages to the history books, 
achieves equality between killer and killed, teaches lovers to write letters, accustoms young women to waiting, fills the newspapers with articles and pictures, builds the new houses for the orphans, invigorates the coffin makers, gives the grave diggers a pat on the back, and paints a smile on the leader's face. The war works with unparalleled diligence, yet no one gives it a word of praise.
I look at you and I think of your colleagues across the globe. I started writing this poem uh, after 2014, and then it sort of formed around 2017, 2018. Of course, we think of February 2022, the invasion. Um, but this poem is kind of about Ukraine, but also when I was writing, I was thinking about wars that I have yet to that have yet to happen to. It's called um, 12 Roses for the Dead. The militia kick a soccer ball in the street. Young men, gray beards, rifles, heavy weapons, stories, laughter. Their shivering hands boiling coffee in a tin over a crude fire. The buildings no longer buildings. Landscapes of rubble given to howling when a storm comes in. The ceasefire will be announced soon and the fighting will resume until the deadline. A vital rail line must be captured or defended or perhaps a sympathetic town must be liberated. In high-rise offices somewhere far away, architects design new orphanages, new hospitals, maybe a mausoleum to be placed in the cemetery as a way to honor the dead. There is too much good work to be done. Lists of provocations, demands, diplomatic teams negotiating in distant cities, flashbulbs ringing. And so the militia oil their bolts check their radios. They smoke their last cigarettes and fall in line. It will take hours to reach the front, enough time to consider the smoke drifting over the treetops, that grim, dark grove of chestnuts marching toward the horizon before them. And the dead woman lying by the roadside as they pass by, she continues to be dead, perfecting the task, though not one soul stops or offers her the slightest bit of help. One hundred years of sleep. I don't want to be the princess. I only want to be her sleep for one hundred years. I want to skip the problems of the 21st century. Water pollution, killing virus, nuclear war, Capsized boats carrying runners away from their homelands. I may miss important inventions and new songs and weekends when people go out to their dates all followed by one moon. I may open my eyes for a moment to take a glimpse of the universe and its beauty and then will close them again. But what if my loved ones surrounded me and whispered in my ear one by one. I would wake up, of course. There's nothing like the falling of strings into an unexpected chord. Um, what's, what's the last music you think you'll ever hear in your life? The last notes, what might they sound like, you know? <laughs> the bodies, the bodies lie along the shoulder of the road. The bodies lie in an ambulance, a truck bed, a stretcher. The bodies are strobed in flaring lights, color of fire, color of night. The bodies rest within the fuselage of a plane at 36,000 feet. The bodies contemplate silence as they wait in the morgue. The bodies are moved from room to room, one hour to the next. The bodies are bathed by strangers and by those who love them. They are numbered and recorded with signatures and stamps. They are forgotten by all save those who love them. They are left to the fields, to the green embrace of the earth. They are given sunlight and storm, a shadow of wings descending. They are given to rivers, to fire, to ash and the wind-driven rain. They are carried on the shoulders of stone-faced men. They are serenaded with tears, with the instruments of suffering. They are eulogized in great halls and within the confines of loneliness. They are lowered into the ground and into the vaults of memory. They are assembled and disassembled by the steady labor of time. They learn more about compassion as they are lifted in someone's arms. They learn more about the sacred as voices call out around them. They learn more about grieving as their eyes are sewn shut. The bodies are moved from room to room, one hour to the next. 
The bodies are numbered and recorded with signatures and stamps. The bodies are bathed by strangers and by those who love them. The bodies contemplate silence as they wait in the morgue, and they are forgotten by all save those who love them. One more love poem. If I had one more day, I would write a love poem composed of one word repeated like binary code. I'll multiply it by the number of days that pass without saying it to you, and I'll add the days when I said it with no words, because I want to say it more. And like a bee gathering pollen, I'll collect everything ever said in one word, like a square root multiplied by the power of 10. 
I'll count even that day when my anger at you or for you turned me into a stone. And also the days when I was away, sending my songs like postcards to the lonely, feeling you in every touch of love I gave to the world. I'll count all my days, even the nine months of days before I was born, to say this exponential growing, I love you. The soldiers enter the house. The soldiers enter the house. Soldiers determined and bored, searing with adrenaline, enter the house with shouting and curses and muzzle flash, debt cord and 5.56 millimeter ball ammunition. The soldiers enter the house with pixelated camouflage, flex cuffs, chem lights, door markings, duct tape. The soldiers enter the house with ghillie suits and Remington sniper rifles, Phoenix beacons and night vision goggles, lasers invisible to the naked eye, rotor blades, hellfire missiles, bandoliers strapped across their chests. The soldiers enter the house one fire team after another and they fight brutal, dirty, nasty, the only way to fight. The soldiers enter the house with the flag of their nation sewn under the sleeves of their uniforms. They enter the house of Toledo and Baton Rouge and printed on the rubber soles of their desert combat boots. They enter the house and shout, honey, I'm home and here's Johnny. The soldiers enter the house with conversations of Monday night football and the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders. They enter the house with obscenities on their tongues. They enter the house with paperbacks and in their cargo pockets, starship troopers and Black Hawk down. We were soldiers once and young. The soldiers enter the house straight out of Compton or with Eminem saying, look, if you had one shot or one opportunity, they enter the house with their left foot. They enter the house the way one enters cemeteries or unclean places. The soldiers enter the house with their insurance policies filled out and signed, beneficiaries named, last will and testament sealed in manila envelopes half a world away. The soldiers enter the house having just ordered a new set of chrome mufflers on eBay for the Mustang stored under blankets in a garage north of San Francisco. The soldiers enter the house with only nine credits earned toward an associate's degree from the University of Maryland. They kick in the door and enter the house with a memory of backyard barbecues on their minds. They kick in the door while cradling their little sisters in their arms. They kick in the door and pull in the toboggans and canoes from the hillsides and lakes of Minnesota. They kick in the door and bring in the horses from the barn, hitching into the kitchen table inside. The soldiers enter the house with Mrs. Ingram from second grade at Vinland Elementary School and Mrs. Garupa from AP English of Midera High. The soldiers kick the door in and enter the house with their arms filled with all the homework they ever did. And they sit down to consider the quadratic equation, the Socratic method. The soldiers sit in the house cross-legged on the floor as the family inside watches on, watches how the soldiers interrogate them, saying, how do I say the word for friend in Arabic? How do I say the word love? How do I tell you that Private Miller is dead, that Private Miller has holes in the top of his head? What is the word for ghosts in Arabic? And how many live here? And are the, both, are the ghosts Ba'ath Party supporters? Are the ghosts in favor of the coalition forces? Are the ghosts here with us now? Can you tell us where the ghosts are hiding? And where they keep their weapons cache? And where they sleep at night? And what can you tell us about Alibaba? Is there an Alibaba in the neighborhood? The soldiers enter the house and take off their dusty combat boots and pull out an anthology of poetry from an assault pack, Iraqi Poetry Today and commence reading poems aloud. The soldiers say, this is war then, all is well. They say the missiles bomb the cities and the airplanes bid the clouds farewell. The soldiers remove their flak vests and turn off their radios, smile and stretch their arms, one of them yawning, another asking for a second cup of chai. The soldiers give chocolate to the frightened little children in the shadows of the house. The soldiers give chocolates to the frightened little children and teach them how to say fuck you and how to flip off the world. The soldiers recite poetry as trays of chai and tea and cigarettes are brought into the room and the soldiers there in the candlelight of the front room with the Iraqi men of military age zip tied with flex cuffs and kneeling sandbags over their heads read verses from Iraqi poetry today. The soldiers switch off their night vision goggles and set their padded helmets on the floor while the frightened little children pretend to eat the chocolates they've been given. 
their mothers shushing them when they begin to cry, and soldiers, men from Kansas and California, Tacoma and College Station, they remove the gloves from their hands to show the frightened little children they mean them no harm, how American they are, how they might bring in a pitcher of water for the bound and blinded men to drink from soon, perhaps if there's time, and how they read poetry for them, their own poetry in English, saying between time and time, between blood and blood, all is well. All is well, the soldiers say. The soldiers kick in the doors and into the house and zip tie the men of military age and shush the women and the frightened little children and drink the spoon sugar stirred into the hot chai and remove their stinking boots and take off their flak vests and stack their weapons and turn off their night vision goggles and say to the frightened little children softly with their palms held out in the most tender of gestures they can offer, their eyes as brown as the hills that lead to the mountains or as blue as the rivers that lead to the sea saying, all is well, little ones. All is well. A second life. After this life, we'll need a second life to apply what we learned in the first. We make one mistake after another and need a second life to forget. We hum endlessly as we wait for the departed. We need a second life for the whole song. We go to war and do everything Simon says. We need a second life for love alone. We need time to serve our terms in prison so we can live free in our second life. We learn a new language but need a second life to practice it. We write poetry and pass on and need a second life to know the critics' opinions. We rush around all over the place and need a second life to stop and take pictures. Suffering takes time. We need a second life to learn to live without pain.
eulogy. It happens on a Monday at 11.20 a.m. as tower guards eat sandwiches and seagulls drift by on the Tigris River. Prisoners tilt their heads to the west, though burlap sacks and duct tape blind them. The sound reverberates down concertina coils the way piano wire thrums when given slack. And it happens like this on a blue day of sun when Private Miller pulls the trigger to take brass and fire into his mouth. The sound lifts the birds up off the water. A mongoose pauses under the orange trees and nothing can stop it now. No matter what blur of motion surrounds him, no matter what voices crackle over the radio in static confusion, because if only for this moment, the earth is stilled and Private Miller has found what low hush there is down in the eucalyptus shade there by the river. My poem will not save you. Remember the toddler lying face down on the sand and the wave gently receding from his body as if a forgotten dream? My poem will not turn him into his back and lift him up to his feet so he can run into a familiar lap like before. I'm sorry my poem will not block the shells when they fall into a sleeping town will not stop the buildings from collapsing around their residence, will not pick up the broken leg flower from under the shrapnel, will not raise the dead. My poem will not defuse the bomb in the public square. It will soon explode where the girl insists that her father buy her gum. My poem will not rush them to leave the place and ride the car that will just miss the explosion. Many mistakes in life will not be corrected by my poem. Questions will not be answered. I'm sorry, my poem will not save you. My poem cannot return all of your losses, not even some of them. And those who went far away, my poem won't know how to bring them back to their lovers. I'm sorry, I don't know why the birds sing during their crossings over our ruins. Their songs will not save us, although in the chilliest times they keep us warm. And when we need to touch the soul to know it's not dead, their songs give us that touch. How are you all doing all right? Yeah? All right, rock and roll. I appreciate being here with Dunya. And it seems like the musicians are way over there, like we're not on the same team, but it's been awesome to, to do this with you all. Um, call it leaves and rain. I was walking through the middle of my life, walking down to Visadero Street wearing old desert combat fatigues, listening to the antifreeze boil over. I was listening to the antifreeze boil over in conversations on the street, that dead end steaming hiss of radiators run 100,000 miles and more. The radiators boiled over in fatigue while I was walking 100,000 miles down to Visadero Street in Fresno and it was July and the asphalt was speaking its vapor and I was wearing combat boots and walking through the middle of my life. I was listening to war. I was listening to war on Visadero Street and learning how to ride low through the rest of my life, learning how to walk the blocks in tighter and tighter circles the way the lost do. In tighter and tighter circles I was lost to the war on Visadero Street. I was circling the war the way vapor curls from the steaming hiss of dead radiators in Fresno. I was circling the lost in Fresno, wearing my combat boots worn down 100,000 miles and counting. And I was counting. I counted each dying face passing by. I counted the birds with their exhausted voices. I counted the sentinel birds perched silent at the eucalyptus above. I circled the eucalyptus birds and listened for their medicine the way the lost do in Fresno, wearing combat boots and speaking in vapor. I was circling through the middle of my life, right there under the medicine trees, listening to the silence of the sentinel birds and waiting for them to boil over in steam. But that's not what birds do. Birds break open in orange and red. Medicine birds have eucalyptus leaves for feathers and they bandage the air when they fly. They are impervious to war and hiss and steam and vapor and combat and the circling lost. Medicine birds fly through the windows to land in our beds when we're dreaming our circling dream of Divisadero and Fresno with its lost and circling war. 
Medicine birds have eucalyptus wings, and when they fly in our beds, they transform themselves into leaves and rain and lovers. The lovers in our beds are eucalyptus birds flying medicine through the windows in our heads. The lovers in our beds fly eucalyptus through the circling loss. The lovers in our beds bring medicine to our lips and call it eucalyptus, call it love, call it leaves and rain for our exhausted souls. The shape of the world. If the world were flat, like a flying carpet, our sorrow would have a beginning and an end. If the world were square, we would lie low in a corner whenever the world plays hide and seek. If the world were round, our dreams would take turns on the Ferris wheel and we would all be equal. All right, folks, just so you know, this is like the, what they call the two-poem warning. I'm going to read a poem, and then Dunya and the musicians are going to take us out with an amazing thing. A very short poem called al Hazan of Basra. If I could travel a thousand years back to August 1004, to a small tent where al Hazan has fallen asleep among books about sunsets, shadows, and light itself, I wouldn't ask whether light travels in a straight line or what governs the laws of refraction, or how he discovered the bridgework of analytical geometry. I would ask about the light within us, what shines in the mind's great repository of dream, and whether he studied the deep shadows daylight brings, how light defines us.
tablets. Like the turtle, I walk everywhere with my home on my back. The dead act like the moon. They leave the earth behind and move away. The spider makes a home outside itself. It doesn't call it exile. No, I'm not bored of you. The moon too appears every day. The lanterns know the value of night, and they are more patient than the stars. They stay until morning. Those colorful flowers over the mass graves are the dead's last words. The earth is so simple. You can explain it with a tear or a laugh. The earth is so complicated. You need a tear or a laugh to explain it. We have one minute and I love you. The sweet moment is over. I spent an hour thinking of that moment. The map of Iraq looks like a mitten, and so does the map of Michigan, a match I made by chance. If you can't save people, at least don't hate them. We are not upset when the grass dies. We know it will come back in a season or two. The dead don't come back, but they appear every time in the greenness of the grass. When the sun is absent, the flower misses her. And when the absence grows long, the flower looks inside herself for another light. I'm the plural who walks to you as a singular one. She asked the night, why are you so dark? Night answered, so that the star's light reaches you. She asked the day, why don't you light? Day answered, because I became your shadow. If thieves come to your home, let them take everything except your dreams. Keep those in a safe box. The trees, like us, resort to their roots in times of danger. During the pandemic, we are a forest. Trees standing alone together. There are days we wait for and they come, and there are days that happen to us and we cannot avoid. The bubbles in the aquarium are the fish's notes about the world. When the bird is prevented from singing, 
His body turns into music, filling the horizon. The birds never ask if you are going to heaven or to hell, and they never divide the sky into stations. When the birds chirp in your head, trust their message for you, especially if they tell you, for example, flying is your true home. What if the guns turn into pencils in the hands of the soldiers and they underline the places on the map as sights they must see before they die? Thank you so much. Um, the poets and performers will be here at the front of the stage for anyone who'd like to ask questions or have a book signed. Cadets, you are dismissed. <laughs>